Hey, Chris Ferdinandi from GoMakeThings.com here. Um, recently, I've had a few folks mention that um, they've tried to read through some of my JavaScript plugins and found that the way I structure my code a bit confusing. They didn't really understand what was kind of going on under the hood. So today, I thought it might be helpful for me to actually walk through one of my plugins and explain why all of the different pieces are set up the way they are. Now, to be fair, the way I write my plugins is a lot more complex than they potentially have to be. Um, you could accomplish all the same stuff I'm doing in any of my plugins with a little bit less code um, and maybe something that's just a little bit easier to read. Uh, but the way I set up my code is I really want to make sure that if someone is not a JavaScript developer or they're not comfortable with JavaScript, they can still customize the plugin to meet their needs without um, kind of feeling intimidated by having to touch a bunch of code and go in and change variables and things like that. Um, the other thing I also really like to do is make sure that it's really flexible and extensible. So if someone wants to make modifications or use some of the aspects of my plugin and another plugin, they can do so without having to touch the core code. Um, uh, it really helps my plugins scale, makes them adaptable to other projects, while also providing you with an easy path to upgrade as bug fixes and things like that come out. Um, so anyways, with all that in mind, let's actually just kind of dig into a plugin and, and see how everything's set up. Um, today we're going to be looking at validate.js. This is a new plugin I released that um, provides form validation using the native HTML5 um, form validation elements and attributes. Um, so, you know, things like required and pattern, um, type equals email, that sort of stuff. So um, the very first thing you notice at the top of my plugin is this weird kind of wrapper header thing. Um, this is what uh, what's known as a UMD wrapper. Uh, UMD is an acronym for Universal Module Definition. And what this does is it combines um, things like common JS and AMD or asynchronous module definition into a single kind of wrapper, which is where you've got this if, else, if, else thing going on. Um, so basically it's trying to determine what type of environment it's working in um, and then uh, provides the right, um, the right kind of header accordingly. So for example, if you wanted to use like Webpack or Browserify or Node or um, any other kind of module bundler, Broccoli I think is another one, um, I don't use any of those, but if you wanted to use a module bundler or package manager to load this onto your page, you can. Without this header, you wouldn't be able to do that. And if it only conformed to just common JS or just AMD, there's a whole bunch of module loaders that you wouldn't be able to use. Um, so this provides a lot of flexibility and makes sure that this can be used by anybody, um, including people like me who literally just kind of add a script tag and use the script just as is. Um, the only caveat with a wrapper like this is the window gets renamed to root inside the script. Um, so if I was trying to add an event listener to the window, for example, rather than doing window add event listener like this, um, that would have to be root add event listener. And I end up messing this up all the time. So one of the things I'll do if I'm working with a, a UMD wrapper like this is I'll just go variable window equals root. Um, that way, when I, I invariably type the wrong thing, I won't break my code in certain environments. Uh, next thing you'll notice here is use strict. Um, all this does is it tells browsers and JavaScript linters to be more aggressive in throwing bugs with my code, um, which sounds like a bad thing, but all you're really doing is, is you're saying you want them to be a lot more strict with how they validate your code um, so that if there's any bugs or any errors, you pick up on those sooner and um, and help uh, you know make sure that your code is going to be cleaner, um, better written, um, and less likely to kind of encounter unforeseen issues down the road. Um, so one of the really big things I like to do in my plugins is um, really keep everything kind of structured and organized. So you'll notice I have these kind of these header sections. So I keep my variables up at the top of uh, of the scripts. And then I get into my methods, and then all those are all the just kind of the functions I use in my scripts or my plugins. And then all the way down at the bottom is where I have um, my public APIs, and I'll talk about those in in a few minutes. But um, I just it's important to know ahead of time that I am um, 
I keep everything like really kind of structured into these different sections. It makes it easier to find stuff when, when I need to because they're not just scattered all over the plugin. Um, so this very first thing here is this, uh, this variable validate and it's just an empty object. Uh, so one of the things I do in my plugins is I have some private uh, functions like get closest. Those can only be used inside validate.js. And then I have others like validate dot has error. So I'm now I'm pushing this function into that empty object I set up ahead of time. And then all the way down to the end of my script where this public API section is, you can see I'm returning that object. So when you go to use this script, you can actually call any of those public APIs. So I could, I could go validate has error um, outside of the script and you know pass in, pass in my field and it'll actually return something for me. Whereas if I if I tried to do get closest, um, that wouldn't work because that script hasn't been exported outside of the plugin. So there's no way to access it. So that's all I'm doing there. Um, I'm also setting up a support variable and I'm identifying the JavaScript APIs I need in order for this script to work properly. Um, so in this case, query selector and add event listener are two big ones. And if your browser doesn't support those, the script just isn't going to work for you. Um, everything else has older browser support than these two. So these are the only two I'm checking. And then I'm also setting up this settings variable, um, which I'm going to use to store my settings later so that they can be accessed in all the different functions without me having to pass them in. So I'm setting it up not quite as a global variable, but it's global within the context of this plugin. So any function in this plugin will be able to access the settings. Um, and then I have a handful of defaults. So one of the things I do in my plugins is I allow users to pass in their own um, kind of options that override some of these defaults. But in order to do that, I need to first set up the defaults. So you can see I have um, you know, the selectors that I want to use and the different classes that we apply to things. Um, in this case, it is a form validation script. So here are all the different error messages that you can customize. Um, in this case, I also give people the option of preventing the form from submitting like it normally would. So you can do something like an Ajax form submit. So I have a couple of uh, settings for that. And then um, I also include callbacks both before and after various things run. Uh, and this is where a lot of the flexibility comes in. So, um, so by adding these callbacks, people who want to bolt in their own functionality later have different hooks within the code that they can use to do that. Um, so if you want to, for example, run a uh, run something, um, like make some modifications to a form before you show an error, you can now do that by passing in a callback for before show error. Um, or similarly, if you want to do something before or after you remove an error, you have an option to do that um, without having to come in and actually modify the core code. Then we get into the various methods that I use in this script. So um, right here, I just I have a polyfill for the, the matches um, method, which is uh, really, really useful. And um, it's supported very inconsistently amongst browsers. Um, a lot of the browsers that do support it do so with a vendor prefix. So I just slap in this polyfill so that it works everywhere. And then I've got all my helper functions. So extend I use to um, merge to um, two objects together. So this is how I merge my defaults with my um, user submitted settings. And we'll see that in a little bit. Um, get closest is a little function I use to climb up the DOM and find the closest matching element um, that has a particular selector. So for example, you could pass in, um, pass in an input and then find the closest form that has the right class or something like that. Um, and then we get into some of my other, uh, my other scripts. So here we've got, um, we've got has error um, and show error. So, you know, this is checking to see if there is an error, showing the error and so on. I'm actually gonna come back to these in a minute though, because first I wanna scroll all the way down to the bottom. Um, script kind of works its way from the bottom up. So the very first thing someone's gonna do is they're going to initialize this script. Um, and I do that for all of my scripts. So the way they do that is they type validate init. That's all you need to do, the script will work. But if you want to, you can also pass in some options. So for example, um, I could pass in you know, an object and then we could change up the selector from that data attribute to something like JS validate, for example. So when you do that, um, uh, we need a way to kind of merge those together. So you'll notice in this validate.init function, the very first thing I'm doing 
is checking my browser support. So if the browser doesn't support query selector or add event listener, it's just gonna cancel altogether because um, there's no point in setting everything up. It's just gonna throw some errors. The next thing I do is run this destroy function. And I'll show you what that does in a minute. But um, at a high level, what you need to know about that is it undoes any of the changes that the script has already done. So it resets my settings, it removes any of my previous event listeners. Um, if there's any errors on the page, it gets rid of those. It's just basically starting from a fresh slate. So if you initialize and validate has already been initialized once, you're not gonna have all these weird conflicts and things like that. And you're not gonna run stuff twice. Finally, um, I'm going to merge my user options with my defaults. So here's that settings variable again. Um, instead of setting this up as a new variable by saying you know var settings, I'm taking the existing settings variable and just updating it. So what I'm doing is I'm taking that extend method we looked at a minute ago, I'm passing in my defaults, and then I'm also passing in any options the user has supplied, or if they didn't provide any, just an empty object, because if I didn't do that, it would throw an error because there's no, um, you know, I'm passing in a variable that doesn't exist. Um, so what this is doing is it's, it's taking any settings the user has passed in, overriding the defaults with those, and then all the rest of the defaults just kind of remain. And that's my settings variable. Um, and then I just go ahead and kind of get everything set up. So in this case, um, uh, I'm calling this function add no validate, which adds the no validate attribute to all my forms. I'm setting up my event listeners. So um, whenever uh, there's a blur event, it's gonna call my blur handler. Whenever someone tries to submit a form, it's gonna call my submit handler. As we scroll up a little bit, here you can see the destroy function. Um, if, uh, if there's no kind of, if settings doesn't have anything assigned to it yet, there's no need to destroy anything because the plugin has never been initialized. But otherwise, we're gonna go ahead and actually remove those event listeners, remove all the errors. Um, gonna call add no validate again, but with this extra argument that goes and removes no validate from any of the forms that, that have it assigned. And then we're gonna reset settings to null. Uh, as we move up a little bit here, you can see I've got my, my submit handler. Um, and I use a technique called event bubbling. So rather than trying to apply my event listener to every applicable form on the page. I just universally listen for any submits. And then when it happens, I check to see if the submitted form um, has the, um, the selector that we specified for our forms that we're gonna validate. Um, similar thing goes for the, um, uh, for the blur handler. So when someone blurs a, um, uh, a field within a form, I'm checking to make sure that a form actually exists for that field. And if it does, I wanna make sure that that form has our, um, our selector. And if it doesn't, we can just bail. Otherwise, we go ahead and kind of move forward with all of our functions. Um, and here you can see now when someone blurs, we're going to check to see if there's an error. We pass in the event target, which is uh, in this case, the field that was blurred. And if there an, is an error, we're gonna go ahead and show that error um, by passing in the field and then the error message that we got back from has error. Um, and then if there is no error, we go ahead and remove any errors that might might exist in the DOM. Um, one other thing that uh, I know trips a lot of people up is, uh, so you can see I'm, I'm again allowing people to pass in options, even though when I call remove error down here, you can see I'm not passing in an argument for my options. Um, and then I'm setting up this variable called local settings where I'm again extending my settings variable um, or if that doesn't exist, my defaults against the options if they were passed in or if that doesn't exist, an empty object. Now, the reason I do this is if someone wants to just use um, like show error or remove error in another plugin of theirs without ever initializing my script, they may want to pass in some customized options. So they, you know, they may want to do something like validate, remove error, um, field, and then have some, some kind of custom options here, like um, you know, message, bad input, uh, the input is bad, just for example. Um, and I need a way for them to be able to do that. Um, so if I didn't kind of set up this local settings variable, it would just fall back to the, the defaults um, 
or actually settings that haven't even been set yet and throw some errors. So this, um, this makes sure that if someone's gonna call this externally, they have a way to kind of get everything set up and, and get working with it, even if they don't initialize um, validate.js. And uh, you know, same thing goes for for show error. Um, in has error, we're um, you know we're we're doing kind of a sim similar thing. Um, uh, we pass in you know the local options, and then we just kind of go from there. Um, and uh, and yeah, and that brings us back up to kind of where we where we picked off. So that's um that's how I. Um, that's how I set up my plugins. I hope that makes things a little bit clearer. Um, there's a chance that I made things more confusing. And if so, um, please send me an email. Um, if you go to gomakethings.com slash about, you can find my contact information. Um, ask away. If need be, I'll create another video where I explain things more clearly than I did today. But that's, um, that's how I set up my plugins in a nutshell. Um, and I, I hope that um, made things more clear for everybody. Have a great day.